Okay, I will uh, call this property tax division report um, March 27th uh, to order. We do have quorum and can conduct lawful business. First on the agenda is to approve the uh, previous minutes. Uh, Vice Chair Lee, have you had a chance to review? <coughs> yes, Mr. Chair, and I, I move uh, to approve the minutes from March 20th. Okay, it's been moved. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oppose? Motion carries. Minutes are adopted. All right, uh, first on the agenda today is House File 5062. Um, welcome, Representative uh, Censormura, uh, on your bill. Um, chair moves that House File um, 5062 be laid over for possible inclusion into the um, tax division report. Um, to your bill. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Liz Lagarde and committee members. My bill, HF5062, <laughs> seeks to establish a property tax exemption that would apply to the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe's Twin Cities office, which is located in the Seward neighborhood in my district in Minneapolis. This Twin Cities office is a key location to serve the approximately 1,600 Leech Lake Band citizens who reside in the greater metro area, as well as the larger Twin Cities native community. This property is owned and staffed by the Leech Lake Band and offers a physical location that is much closer than the 200 plus mile drive to the Leech Lake government offices in Cass Lake. Indeed, while many of those served at the Twin Cities office are my constituents, many also come to the greater metro area to access services ranging from elder programming, vaccination clinics, child welfare assistance, and a place to host community gatherings and celebrations. I have some testifiers who are uh, remote today um, because of the weather and the long drive down who can share more all about the community services that occur at the Leech Lake Twin Cities office and can share more details about the history of this parcel um, and answer any questions from the committee regarding the proposed property tax exemption. Okay, well, thank you. And uh, first up, we have uh, the Secretary Treasurer of Leech Lake, um, Fine Day. Yes. Okay, um, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Leonard Feinde and I serve as Secretary Treasurer for the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. And I would like to thank Chair Liz Lagarde and committee members for the opportunity to testify and support a House file 5062 today. I also appreciate the, uh, the ability to offer this testimony virtually and thank the committee and staff for making this accommodation. I also would like to thank Representative Censor Murrah for introducing this important legislation on our behalf. House file 5062 would authorize a property tax exemption for the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe Twin Cities office building located at 2438 27th Avenue South in the Seward neighborhood of Minneapolis. The building is operated by the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe government and provides programs and services offered by the tribal government to Leech Lake citizens living in the Twin Cities metro area. The tribal government programs provided at the Leech Lake Twin Cities office include permanent space for our child <coughs> welfare program, legal department, tribal assistance, and elder advocates. The Twin Cities office also offers community members access to faxing, copying, phones, computers, notary public services, and access to our monthly tribal newspaper, the Debajimon. Administrative staff are on site to update personal contact information as well for individual band members to maintain ongoing contact with the tribal government. In addition to these programs and services that are available on a daily basis, the Leech Lake Twin Cities office also hosts many community events uh, throughout, hosts many community events and provides a location for on-reservation programs to provide services as needed. The Twin Cities office hosts community gatherings, vaccination clinics, expungement clinics, tribal council quarterly meetings, Toys for Tots drives, and many other activities. Leech Lake acquired this property in 2019, and there was a commercial tenant that was pre-existing in the building that Leech Lake uh, took on when we acquired the building. This lease recently expired, and that commercial tenant is moving out. We have a need to utilize the entire parcel of property for our services that we offer at the building. And so as we explored options for the space being vacated by the tenant, we discovered that the property tax assessments would be a substantial burden for occupying the entire building solely with our government programs. Without a tenant to offset a portion of the tax obligation, the cost to Leech Lake to operate the building exclusively for government purposes would increase substantially. 
Currently, the property taxes represent two-thirds of the anticipated building operating costs for the current year. The result is increased costs uh, in delivering critical important services for our urban citizens that is around triple what it would be without the property taxes. The services offered by the Leech Lake Twin Cities office are the same as those offered by other governments that benefit from exempt property tax status. As the members of this committee know, one of the unavoidable costs of conducting government business is office space and the property needed for that office space. Tripling the cost for office space reduces the quality and quantity of services that governments are able to provide. In order to expand the government services available to Leech Lake citizens through our Twin Cities office, it is necessary to limit the cost as much as possible. The Leech Lake Band is dedicated to maintaining existing programs and services available to urban band citizens, and we intend to increase and improve those services. Gaining the ability to qualify for a tax exemption based on the operation of these programs and services at our Twin Cities office would enhance the ability to pursue this intent. On behalf of the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe, I want to thank the committee members for their time and consideration of this important <coughs> legislation and for the opportunity to testify. I'm happy to answer any questions. We also have our general counsel and legal director, Christopher Murray, who is available as well to answer any questions. <coughs> thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I do have on the list uh, Christopher uh, Murray. Do they want to testify or just here for questions? It's totally up to you. Um, I'm just here to uh, respond to any questions as necessary. The testimony that uh, we intended to provide was provided by <laughs> Secretary Treasurer Fine Day. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, anyone else in the audience want to uh, testify for or against? Seeing none, uh, member discussion. Seeing none, <laughs> closing comments. Thank you, thank you, Chair Lizagard. Thank you, committee members. I'm, you know, I'm really proud to have this facility in my district, and I hope that you consider them for this property tax exemption. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, so with that, Chair renews his motion that House File 5062 be laid over for possible inclusion in the ta property <laughs> tax division report. It, the bill is laid over. All right. Um, I will shift over because I'm next. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Chairless Lagarde moves that House File 3992, the first engrossment, be laid over for possible inclusion in the property tax division report. Okay, correction. <laughs> uh, all right, hang on one sec, folks. Thank you for your indulgence. Okay, so um, Mr. Chair, um, is it your motion to move House File 3992, the first engrossment, to be re referred to the Taxes Committee? That is correct, Madam Chair. All right, thank you, Chair Lissagard. Uh, to your bill. Okay, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and uh, committee members. House File uh, 3992 is a critical first step of several designed to help our rural ambulance service operating. Um, I know this is an important issue um, to the committee and also the health committee who has uh, done considerable work in this area. Um, thankfully, I've had an opportunity to travel um, across uh, the state of Minnesota with <laughs> Representative Hewitt, who chairs the EMS task force. And um, what we have seen, um, we've seen that there is a, we're at a, there's a crisis before us. And ambulance uh, services that provide a critical need to all of um, people in the state of Minnesota um, is, is failing. And it's falling um, to a point where it could collapse. And the bill before you is for 122 million, um, and that only is a band-aid to stop the bleeding, um, uh, to be able to provide this service. And so, um, I'm going to continue to push for this. I believe that it, it needs to be the full amount, and uh, I do know and understand that there are different uh, um, budget targets and and stuff like that. But uh, I'm committed to. Uh, 
furthering this conversation as it goes through the process. So um, before I turn it over to the testifier, um, I know that uh, guardrails in reporting is extremely important to the, um, Chair Gomez, who is uh, you know, frankly right uh, in being adamant about um, uh, um, having these in place. So if I could, could I have uh, Jared uh, walk through the reporting requirements in this bill? Sure, Mr. Swanson. <laughs> Uh, Chair Lee and members, the reporting requirements in the bill are found in subdivision 7, which is on page 3 um, of the bill text. And this subdivision would require that any recipient of the aid uh, by the end of calendar year 2025 submit a report to the Commissioner of Revenue and to the legislature on how the aid was used. So the report would need to include the amount of aid that each provider received the amount of aid that that provider spent on operational expenses and the amount of aid that was spent on capital expenses. The providers would also need to include documentation um, sufficient to establish that the aid was spent on eligible uses and the Commissioner of Revenue under this subdivision is allowed to request financial statements or any other information that's necessary to verify that the aid was spent on eligible uses. Great. Thank you, Mr. Swash. Is that sufficient? Yep. Okay, so uh, next we'll move on to testifiers. First on our list is uh, Eric Simonson. Uh, please state your name and your affiliation for the record. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Eric Simonson. I am representing the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities today. The coalition is a representative of approximately 110 cities uh, in the 80 counties outside the seven county metro area. Uh, generally, we advocate on issues like local government aid, uh, property tax relief, transportation, uh, economic development. This is kind of our first uh, venture into the public safety space, but it is because our members have made it a high legislative priority this year. Uh, you might ask why does the CGMC care about this bill? It is because more than half of the licenses are owned by some unit of local government across Minnesota, uh, and many of our members uh, participate in that. We want to focus in on the issues that are, I think are important to the property tax division. And that is to put yourselves in the space of a local city councilor or a local mayor that happens to operate an ambulance service. Historically, revenues uh, have come in at levels that were enough to at least break even. But for the past several years, as has been pointed out several times at several committee stops, the fee for service model is broken. Uh, the reimbursement model is broken and these operations are being asked to subsidize the local ambulance operation to the tune in some cases of a million dollars or more. It depends on the size of the service. But in the eyes of the local council, oftentimes the primary service area that the ambulance is covering goes far outside the boundaries of their city. If you as a local city councilor is being asked to support a tax levy increase for your local taxpayers to provide a service outside of that space, outside of that boundary, that is a very difficult decision to make. And that is what our members are worried about. This bill came from local government because we care about trying to find a solution. As Representative Liz Lagarde said, uh, and we thank him for his efforts behind this, um, this is a make or break for us. We have literally cities that are facing decisions that they don't want to face and that is a matter of do we continue or do we give up this license. Uh, I don't want to get into all the components of the bill because we'd be here for an hour but I want to just impress upon you how important this is from the property tax scope if you will uh, how we need to do this and I'll just leave you with one example quick. City of Nashwalk which is on the west end of the range uh, owns and operates uh, a local ambulance service, providing a service for several hundred square miles outside their little city of 900 people. Uh, they are facing repeated losses year after year after year and have got to the position where we cannot do this any longer. They tried to put their uh, PSA license up for bid, try to get uh, put out an RFP, see if anybody would provide that service for them. No one bid on it, no one. That is telling because this is no longer a lucrative business because of the problems with the reimbursement model. So this is critically important to local units of government. We're glad that it's being heard in this committee. We're thankful for Representative Liz Lagarde and his support. Uh, and with that, Madam Chair, I would wrap up my testimony. Thank you, Mr. Simonson. Uh, next, I have Cap. Welcome to the committee. I think this is your first time here, maybe, this year. 
This year for sure. All right, please state your name and your affiliation for the record. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Members, my name is Kappa Rourke. I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Association of Small Cities. We advocate on behalf of the over 700 cities with populations under 5,000. Over 90 such cities operate currently operate a PSA. And as Mr. Simonson noted, this is a has been a problem, but it has really reached a critical point. We have small communities like Nashwalk and others scattered throughout the state that are operating in EMS services that they are not the, the um, they are not being the finances coming from the insurance are not meeting their needs and they're in the red and they've some of these cities have been in the red for the last five to eight years and and frankly it's been a it's been a piece where they've been okay with it. They understand that this is a critical service and they've been able to survive, but coupled with the lack of reimbursement and the volunteer services that they've been relying on, which are being coming harder and harder to find, providing these services not only to their communities, but to the surrounding cities as all is just becoming untenable. This $120 million across the state is needed for our small cities, the vast majority of this money as written in this would likely go to small communities. We've, I've been asked this question about what is the breakdown of from this bill, how it would be dispersed and go to small cities and large cities and who the operators are. The problem with that is we're not sure we can only look at this anecdotally because a lot of this is private data, but we know based on the volunteer hours for small cities, a significant portion is this is going to go to the public programs and more importantly to the small cities that are struggling and having to make the decision of putting their PSA up and potentially having the, the situation where there is no service in that area. Great. Thank you. Are there members of the public who wish to testify on this bill? Nope. Okay. Uh, seeing none, we'll move to member discussion. Um, I have first on my list uh, Representative Hewitt. Hoping uh, yeah, let Re Representative Quam go first. I can go last. <laughs> okay. Oh no, he's sir. The, he's the all right, all right, all right. So, Sorry. So, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Chair Lizagard, for bringing this forward. I am a sponsor on the bill, um, and it brings up a lot of questions that we heard on the task force over. Um, this was <coughs> this was by far the largest area of that. The people, the stakeholders came back to us with, with is revenue. Um, they are so uh, uh, under right now. And the question that we keep coming back on a lot of this is number one, how did this happen? Um, and uh, doing some root cause analysis, number one, the aging population in rural Minnesota is happening. And plus, the people younger are moving out of it. And so the aging population is pretty much a Medicare, Medicaid reimbursement pool and so um, that gets reimbursed at uh, in Medicaid dollars for ambulance services usually 20 to 23 cents on the dollar and in Medicare it's usually about 30 cents on the dollar so when you're operating an ambulance service in <coughs> rural Minnesota you have to also have that obstacle there's a lot of questions here how does a volunteer service end up like losing all this money and things like that and I think those are still yet to be answered but it doesn't negate the fact that cities still have to pay the insurance on these ambulance services and uh, pay for the ambulance, keep the updates, keep the regulatory body intact. And on top of that, they also have a, um, they, uh, <coughs> the uh, ongoing costs that they're absorbing because really a lot of these places are not volunteer. Um, they're paid on call. Um, even like we did a study on Representative Backer's area, <coughs> and if we had to pay for full-time EMTs in his area, which we are probably looking at in the future, um, because we just don't have the volunteer base anymore, um, we would have to, and his run volume for his area was, okay, we'd have to pay, you'd have to bill out $9,800 per run in that area. And that's uh, the average run in the Twin Cities, I think, right now is $2,500 a run. And if you don't have volume, there's no way to pay for this. So um, this is a serious question. And I don't know if this amount is even right, the $122 million. Um, this could be, you know, this is a level of public safety that we have to look at. And I think it's in our value statement. And there's a lot of things this group came back with. 
um, that that we're going to try to support this year. Um, number one was yes, a lot of change to the regulatory arm of this that had to be. That I, I really feel firmly that that has to be done. Uh, the second part was um, looking at different ways of doing EMS is really important. Um, we're looking at some models that we want to get out there, and we'll hear more about those bills later on. This one here, though, is the, uh, we keep coming back to the question. We're going to fund it, but where are those funds going to go? And what are they going to be used for? Because I want to hear that the funds are going to make that EMT leave the garage and get on the scene. And uh, we're funding past debt here is what we're doing, which is okay because we need to keep these ambulances out there. But that's the only call I have with this is that, you know, how do we – tell me – in, uh, Representative Lizagard, I'm not going to pick on you for this because you, you heard the same stories I did, but how do we, where's the money? Yeah, actually, your testifier, good. Um, Madam Chair, I'd like the testifier actually to tell us how are the funds going to be used to keep an ambulance on the road? <clears throat> uh, Mr. Simonson. Uh, thank you, Madam okay. Chair. Eric yeah. Simonson with the CGMC again. Uh, Representative Hewitt, uh, you, of course, raised a very excellent question. Uh, and we, of course, as uh, the CGMC, also want that accountability and transparency, and we tried to make sure that uh, this bill reflects that. If you look at the bill, uh, which would be subdivision five, eligible uses, we tried to narrowly focus this to give flexibility to the PSA holder, uh, but at the same time put parameters around how they could spend the money. And it has to be spent on the operation within their primary service area that is located in Minnesota. So we tried to address those border communities where maybe you know, a service in Wisconsin has part of a PSA in Minnesota. Those dollars, if they were eligible, we don't know that they are, uh, but if they were eligible, they would have to be spent on operations within the PSA uh, within those borders. Beyond that, uh, I think there's some level of understanding and hopefully trust uh, with our local units of government and other license holders that those monies would be spent to keep those operations going. Representative Hewitt. Hello. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Mr. Simon, who do you see, um, I, I looked at the bill, who do you see dispersing these funds? Um, is it the regulatory arm or is it, who is it? Mr. Simonson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Hewitt, also a good question. The way the bill is written, the, the monies would be distributed by the Department of Revenue, uh, and they would go out with the second half of the year uh, local aid payments on December 26th. So no dollars would run through the EMSRB, uh, but the EMSRB would obviously play a role in this process, but no dollars would run through the EMSRB. Okay. Representative Hewitt. I'm done for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I think I had next lead qualm, but uh, I think Representative Hollins also wanted to make a comment. So, uh, lead qualm, would you like to wait for? Okay, Representative Hollins. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Liscard, for bringing this bill. Um, you know, I guess I'm not going to get into the. I'm, I'm not going to grill you like this one over here. Thanks. Does. Thank you. <laughs> But I am, I mean, so I'm thinking about this, and I, I represent and live in the city of St. Paul, which doesn't have the same issues, right? But my family, my parents live in a rural community. And so this is actually really near and dear to my heart. And we're currently looking at trying to help them relocate into a city specifically because of this. Because when my mom was having an allergic reaction, she drove herself to the ER, and we were like, that's a terrible idea, right? Like, you could have veered off the road, your throat was swelling up, et cetera. Like, it's just a really horrible system. And I guess when I'm hearing folks say that, you know, um, having these ambulances is no longer a lucrative business, it makes me think that this is not something that should be a business to begin with. Like, this is an essential service that we are providing to the people of Minnesota to keep them safe, to keep them healthy. And I think maybe we need to take a sort of 10,000 foot level look at this and say, what is the system that we wanna live in? Is it a system where only things that are generating a profit are things that are, we're gonna pursue? Or are we gonna look at this as actually the services that we need to provide to our people 
especially our elderly community members in greater Minnesota to make sure that they have access to this and make sure that they're healthy and taken care of. And to my mind, that's really, that's a really important consideration. And it's something that I think we really need to reevaluate just in general, the system that we're having, because even when something's not financially lucrative, it can still be important and we still need to value that. And really when we talk about taxes, that is what we're doing. We're taking our money and putting it where our mouth is. We can say we love seniors. We can say that we wanna support greater Minnesota. That's what these tax dollars are doing. When we tax the people, we use that money to provide those services to those communities. And, and for that reason, I don't think we need to look we need to reevaluate how we're thinking about taxation because the people who are benefiting from it are the people that we claim to care about. And so when, we, when we're professing our care for the aging population, for children, um, for folks who, you know, whatever, have disabilities and live in communities where they don't have those services available, these taxes are helping to make sure that they are able to live their fullest, best lives. And so thank you for bringing this forward. I think, um, I really think that we need to reevaluate how we're thinking about all of these services. I appreciate you. Uh, Chair Lascar, did you want to respond to that? Yeah, I mean, you, you brought, thank you, Madam Chair. And you brought up a, a lot of good points. Everybody knows me. Um, and where I'm from and, and why I continue to fight um, and who I'm fighting for. And in greater Minnesota, we don't have the uh, tax wealth that a lot of the communities down here have. Um, we have a lot of issues that, um, that people take for granted that are just, they're really coming up. This is a broken system. Um, this system was designed, uh, I don't know, in the early 80s when there was more people, younger, big vigor and vitality, people had more civic engagement, more volunteerism, um, not so many mandates, right? And uh, you, when you start to add all this up, aging population, uh, have to go farther away, um, Medicare, Medicaid reimbursement rates at the federal level that we can't control um, are not helping, and we don't have the volume um, that Representative Hewitt just said. Right, at 9,800 9, in backers uh, to do an ambulance run versus 2,500 there. Yeah. I mean, we don't have it. And then we don't have the, uh, the, the wealth, the tax. <clears throat> I wish I had all the businesses up north where I could, we could just raise the levy just a little bit. That's why for, for, for the schools, we can't get in a, a pass a operating um, referendum because we don't have no tax wealth. Right? If you don't have tax wealth, then it goes on to the homeowners. Well, we're aging people. That we're on fixed incomes. There's nothing to get. Yeah. And that's why I'm here fighting for it. This $122.5 million just stops the bleeding. It stops the bleeding. Why did I go after Big Pharma? Because Big Pharma is making billions of dollars in our rural hospitals. The system as a whole is starting to collapse. Where are they going to cut? They're going to they're consolidate. And they're going to cut in greater Minnesota. They're gonna cut where the, the poorer people are. Yep. And that's the people that I represent. This $122.5 million is extremely important yep. to uh, more, more important to greater Minnesota than the seven county metro. I love the seven county metro because you guys contribute so much of the wealth that you do help us. But this system is broken, it needs to be fixed. I appreciate uh, uh, Representative Hewitt's determination. I'm not for um, giving $122.5 million and the next thing you know, they come back next year and say, hey, can we have some more money? No, the system is broken, we gotta figure it out, we gotta stop the bleeding so they don't file bankruptcy and take care of it. They came to us about this. And it's our job to try to manage through it and to come out on the other end to provide the services that everyone deserves in the state of Minnesota. That was a amazing closing, if I ever heard one. But we do have a couple more folks on the list. Thank you, uh, Chair Lissagard. I have next uh, Rep. Coulter. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Chair Lissagard, for bringing this forward. I will, I will say, I mean, it's obviously not as acute a crisis in the metro area, but I have heard from my community about this crisis as well. And I, um, it is something we absolutely need to fix. It's something we need to take action on, absolutely. Um, I just, really, my question is just more around clarity. I'm seeing in subdivision five, 
Um, and this, I think this may be what you were referring to with the, the guardrails and uh, in terms of Chair Gomez, but I just wanna make sure I understand this. So in subdivision five, the eligible uses, the, the only eligible use defined is that it, it must be, the aid must be um, spent in the primary service area located in Minnesota. And then they're, they're reporting requirements on the uses and so on. So um, I, I think just to make sure I'm understanding this, the, the reporting requirements are around uh, capital expenses and operational expenses and so on. Um, but those are that those are not limits on how that aid would be spent. Am I understanding that correctly? Uh, Mr. Holter, I think I'm going to, or Representative Coulter, pardon, <clears throat> I'm going to probably direct your question to Mr. Swanson. Uh, uh, Madam Chair and Representative Coulter, that's correct. So you, um, Subdivision 5 <laughs> outlines the eligible uses, and it, it, it simply says that the aid must be spent within the provider's primary service area within the state of Minnesota. And then those, um, the, the reporting requirements um, r require, um, when submitting the report in 2025, it requires the providers to say how much of that aid was spent on each of those uses listed in, in Subdivision 7, uh, but those are not included in Subdivision 5. Thank you. Representative Coulter. Thank you, that's helpful. And I, I think, um, you know, more, I think more so just for a point of information, I think it, it might be helpful to have sort of uh, greater, greater clarity on beyond those sort of other expenses, what this aid might be spent on, because I, you know, I think we obviously want to make sure that it's it's going to the places it's supposed to go, and and that we know what uh, where this this aid is going. So, um, thank you. That that was helpful. Thank you. Great. Um, oh, and Representative Anderson. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Couple of questions, and again, thanks for the bill. Uh, support it. Uh, this this is badly needed. Uh, just a couple of clarifications, and maybe Mr. Simonson can talk about this. Again, I'm talking about Subdivision Five as well. Eligible expenses in the primary service area. Well, back home where I am, Glenwood, Des Moines, or Benson, for example, they may make an emergency run up to St. Cloud or Fargo. Would that be out of their territory and not be eligible for this reimbursement? Mr. Simonson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Representative. Um, that's a very good question. Uh, there are times when licensed ambulance services will make uh, trips outside their primary service area, for example, on a transfer or, or to some uh, one-off situation where they have to make a, a run outside of their district. That is not meant to be restrictive in terms of them receiving aid. The point of Subdivision 5 was that we want to ensure that any aid received by that licensed ambulance service spends that money on services they're providing within their PSA. So in the, in the example that you brought up, I would say that 99.89% of the time they're going to be operating within their primary service area. And it's really meant to capture uh, operate daily operational expenses, staffing, personnel, benefits, perhaps it's capital expenses, you know, they're paying bonds on, on an ambulance or whatever the case may be, but uh, that would not restrict them from applying for aid or receiving aid, uh, but we wanna make sure that they're spending money on services provided within their PSA. That was the intent. Representative Anderson. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Yep. Well, again, we we realize that this is needed, $120 million, and, and I, you know, someone characterizes this as a Band-Aid, and it, it's a short-term fix, and if, in fact, we aren't going to get this aid without some kind of reform yet this session, you know, the clock is ticking, and um, well over half done with the session, and, and just concerned that... Um, if this isn't done quickly and get that aid out there to those that need it, and then again come back possibly next session or in the interim and, and, and do some of this badly needed reform on reimbursement rates, um, I'm just concerned that the, it may get, may get bogged down and, and, and not done this year, but again, it's badly needed. Thanks for the initiative and uh, let's move this forward. Thank you. Um, and, and last but not least, lead Quam. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, um, I was a little bit surprised that the phrase lucrative was used because when I was on the EMSRB a long time ago, um, I had some exposure to multiple different areas. I, I've got family members that have uh, uh, served on as volunteers in, in these services, and I've never 
seen, you know, that anything that would have that uh, reference to it. Um, the first testifier, uh, I disagree with the statement about recent, um, you know, shortfalls. As long as I've been aware in my area of the state, there have been historic uh, shortage of, you know, they, they come short. Mm -hmm. The fees don't cover, and they've been locally subsidizing this service. Uh, there's discussion, well, what if they cover an area that's outside? I know of uh, services that are no longer there, so the surrounding services are taking and sharing, you know, these days of this week and et cetera. So there is some coverage, but it's not uh, directly from that area. Um, you know, so this has been a long standing problem. Um, the discussion about uh, subdivision five and seven, um, you've got a, a list uh, in subdivision seven. Uh, what about the things that, because of subdivision five, uh, don't fit into the categories of uses in subdivision seven? Is that just listed as, as other? Maybe the staff could let me know. Yeah, I, I will turn the question over to uh, Mr. Swanson. Madam Chair and Representative Kwam, um, the, the, the items that are listed in subdivision seven um, are the only things that need to be included in the report. Um, if there were expenditures um, sort of outside of those categories, um, and the provider could certainly include it in the report, and the commissioner may um, request sort of financial documentation of what some of those other uses were, um, but it's not listed as a, a requirement like the capital expenditures or the operating expenses. Lead Kwam. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Chair. That's, that's what I said other that don't fit in those categories. So what we're hearing is there is no uh, reporting then of the other because it's not in those categories. Um, you know, that seems to be a bit of a weakness. The previous bill, I, I enjoyed that the facility that they had was inside the metro so they have people that needed medical care had a place to go, and it increased accessibility and, and provided for better or decreased disparities in, in health care. And, and I, I was glad to hear that bill. Um, <clears throat> disparities are present because of where you live in the state of Minnesota. Historically, Funding sources from the fees have not covered the costs. Um, you know, I, I came prepared so I didn't have to roll up my sleeves uh, because this is a, a topic that really needs a lot of attention. And frankly, when we had tens of billions I would have loved to have seen a bill like this before us so we can actually try to uh, address. Uh, their Band-Aids are great, but there are a lot of conditions that they won't really help on. And, and, and frankly, um, it, it's disappointing, especially considering that uh, uh, we have no idea where the extra hundred and some, uh, you know, what is your total? 122, 5. 125 million. Um, and, you know, on the supplemental budget, you know, there, there's 16 million. The total supplemental budget is four, less than 478 million. So it's a, it's a huge part of the money that we're guessing is going to be available. But the appropriate time to have done this was last year 
when tens of billions of dollars were available and we gave the attention. But the spotlight wasn't on it then. And I'm not sure if this bill, first of all, help of any measure is appreciated. Um, and I know people that have gone out understaffed on a call to help. Because you don't let the fact that you don't have everything keep you from doing what you can do. <clears throat> but, um, yeah, it, the frustration and disappointment um, are echoes, mere shadows of what I heard after last year. Thank you, Lead Quam. Uh, and uh, Chair Lissagard, closing comments. I I'm, I'm just appreciate your support for the conversations. Thank you. Thank you. So, Chair renews his motion that House File 3992, the first engrossment, be re referred to the Taxes Committee. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Hearing none, the motion is adopted and the bill is re referred to the Taxes Committee. Okay, welcome. Um, the uh, chair moves House File 4540 to be laid over for possible inclusion in the Property <coughs> Tax Division report. Um, to your bill, Representative Kolosky. Thank you very much, Rep, uh, Chair Lissagard and members of the committee for the opportunity to hear uh, House File 4540, which uh, is a result of conversations between the Cook County Board of Commissioners and the Grand Portage uh, Reservation. Grand Portage owns five parcels of land that are outside of its current reservation boundaries and within uh, Cook County and District 1. The Cook County Board has determined in working with the van that it does not wish to assess property taxes over these specific five parcels and in cooperation with the band is asking the legislature to deem them to be tax exempt. It just wanted to note that the county was here. They had a, they had to leave but wanted to make sure that you know they're very proud um, and work to bring this bill forward and support it. Uh, there's a letter in your packets from the Cook County Board to this effect in I'd also just note, uh, Chair and members, that were this land owned by any other unit of govern government, be that state, local, federal, it would actually be tax exempt already. Um, these 2B lands are all rural, vacant, and um, used for public use. And it's just that our statutes simply don't uh, include tribal governments among the list of governments that enjoy that property tax exemption. And so that is the reason for this bill, um, pretty straightforward. And I have also a testifier here uh, to help um, fill in any gaps and ha answer questions. I'll turn it over to my testifier chair. Please state your name for the record. Proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Reed LeBeau and I represent the Grand Portage Band. Uh, we appreciate uh, Representative Kozlowski bringing this bill, and uh, we appreciate the uh, partnership that we have with Cook County. Uh, they brought this idea to us, uh, and we've tried to narrowly tailor the language so that it specifically just refers to the five parcels. Uh, that's similar to the bill that you heard earlier, and uh, bills that have been passed uh, in previous uh, tax bill iterations where uh, when it's property owned by a tribe, uh, the language is specific to the particular parcel in the city. Um, and uh, as Representative Kozlowski said, th the reason it's needed is because the tax exempt statute, uh, it, it delineates all the other types of governments, federal government, state government, uh, and municipalities, but tribes are not included in that list. And so that's why you see this bill and uh, earlier bills uh, so we, we take it from more of a surgical approach than just a blanket uh, exemption across the board and be happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, I do, 
don't see any other testifiers. Um, anyone from the audience want to testify for or against? Seeing none, member discussion? Chair Gomez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, is there any reason that we don't, from your perspective, just like do a general blanket exemption for these lands that are held by tribes that are outside of their um, the reservation boundaries? Um, to your point about you know kind of um, governments uh, having enjoying tax exempt status, um, I'm just wondering if, from your perspective, Mr. Lebeau. Sean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Get Chair Gomez. Veterans is I, I think Monday, is the, when this first came about uh, roughly a decade ago, the concern was that um, tribes hold properties in different uh, ways. And what has been exempted up until this point are, uh, in this case, public use or, in the case of the earlier bill, uh, a government building uh, where government services are being provided. Uh, there could also be properties that are revenue generating properties, which would then be subject to taxation if it's off the reservation and being used for business. So a blanket um, uh, exemption wouldn't take into account those different uses. Anyone else? Representative Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just uh, out of curiosity, has this, these parcels recently been purchased or have they been generating taxes up to this point. What's what's kind of the back history here? Mr. Lebeau. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Representative Anderson. I can't tell you the exact uh, amount of time that the uh, band has held these properties. It has been some time, and they have been paying property taxes on them. And I think that's what spurred uh, Cook County to say, you know, if it were any other type of government that held these particular parcels, we wouldn't be generating uh, tax revenue off them, and, and that's what started the conversation. But I'd be happy to follow up with you with the exact timeline. Representative Anderson? Lee Kwam. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And for curiosity, um, you know, especially with the, the low population, and I assume that there's not a lot of business climbing up there, um, so you're doing this tax exemption but in five years, 10 years, uh, something opens up and there's a, uh, um, you know, something is built on this land that is now generating uh, income. Um, you know, it could be any kind of business. I don't know, I'm not trying to guess. But if you switch from the current and historic, this really, you know, isn't an income type thing to where it's making a lot of money, then does it automatically go back to the tax rolls? Mr. Lebeau. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Representative Kwam. Uh, from your lips to God's ears, if we're able to put something up there that's gonna generate a ton of money, that would be fantastic. <laughs> but um, if the use were to change, then the exemption would go away. Representative Kwam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I wanted that for, you know, the record, but also people, you know, public listens to this. And, and so it, it's key. And you might have noticed a few weeks ago that the largest helium find was up in northern Minnesota. And it's, I, I heard the word billions utilized. It could be a huge thing. So we don't know what might happen to present. And so now the people uh, see that this is a reasonable thing to do now and that if there was something changing dramatically in the future, then, then circumstances would change. So uh, thank you for, for that and uh, thank you for the bill. Okay, anyone else? Seeing none, closing comments. All right, well, thank you uh, members for again hearing this bill and the great questions and discussions. I think this is a shining example of what can happen when we uh, come forward with responsive solutions and uh, work together across all levels of government and ask for your support in including this in your omnibus bill. Thank you very much. Thank you for bringing this forward. Uh, Chair renews his motion that House File 4540 be laid over for possible inclusion in the Property Tax Division Report. The bill is laid over. Thank you.
Okay, the last bill we have up is 50, House File 5046. Chair moves that House File uh, 5046 be laid over for possible inclusion in the Prop Property Tax Division report. And before us, we have Representative Carly Batoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. That's great to be in property taxes. It's my first time. Uh, I wanted to give you all a bit of a background about House File 40, uh, 5046, um, and I have a City of Eden Prairie with me today um, to talk to you about the ongoing efforts in our community and to support the changing needs of communities like mine all across <clears throat> The, the suburban area. So the Southwest Metro is changing. All across Minnesota, we're changing, and, and we embrace that. However, our economy is also changing, and not necessarily in, in ways that we could have or should have predicted. The project site, which is the focus of this tax increment financing bill, is nearly 50 years old. It's our Eden Prairie Center. The Eden Prairie Center was featured in the movie Mall Rats and Mall Rats 2 and also Drop Dead Gorgeous. I know the chair himself has interest in the, the movie industry, so I just wanted to share those tidbits. Nice plug, uh, nice plug. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but since 1976, when the Eden Prairie Center first opened, consumers have dramatically changed the way that they purchase goods. Um, and these changes have impacted the future of the large retail facilities in Eden Prairie and across the country. So our Eden Prairie Center is beginning to experience decline and has, has already seen dramatic reductions in property value. These aren't positive signs for our region and um, we're hoping to get in front of some of the challenges that these sites face. So my community is hoping for climate friendly and transit friendly in redevelopments and investments that celebrate the diverse communities and leverage public investments in our region in the Southwest um, light rail project. House file 5046 can help us do this by providing the tools needed to redesign and complement current usage. So um, there is some precedent for this bill. We understand the same legislation was granted uh, by tax committees previously to the city of Burnsville in 2021 to help them address similar issues related to their aging mall and the decline that was beginning there. Um, Mr. Chair, I would now like to uh, kick it over to my testifier, Eden Prairie's Economic Development Director, Dave Lindahl, who can certainly um, answer most of the committee's questions, if not all of them, and cover some additional detail about the bill. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. State your name for the record. Proceed. Thank you, Dave Lindahl, City of Eden Prairie. I'm the Economic Development Manager. A lot of people say director. Um, thank you for giving me a couple minutes to talk about the mall. Yeah, the Eden Prairie Mall, um, it's the third largest mall in the state of Minnesota. It's got 1.4 million square feet of space, five department stores, four are privately owned. All the inline retail in JC Penney's is actually owned by one owner. And that's the part of the mall that's really uh, challenged economically right now. There's 2,400 jobs at the mall, and those people come from all over the metro area. And it attracts visitors from throughout the region, and it's heyday, it attracted 12 million visitors annually. And unfortunately, since COVID, that's down to about 7 million. Um, so the mall really is a regional attraction, and it's both a local and a, and a regional asset. But like many malls around the country, it's, it's struggling economically. Um, its value plunged 65% over the last four years. It was 85 million in 2019, it's down to 30 million, which is basically land value. Um, the inline retail's at record high vacancies and the mall ownership has actually reverted back to the lender in 2020. So it's really never recovered from COVID. And, and again, the department stores, most of them are doing fine, but we're talking about the inline uh, retail. So the city's been encouraging the mall to consider redeveloping the poorly performing parts of the mall um, to uses that are complementary to retail. Um, and that might help support the retail like hotels and office and, and residential. And they're doing that. They're, they're working on a plan right now for a major redevelopment. Um, which we very much support and we believe the plan will help prevent further decline at the mall. Um, we think it'll help maintain the current employment levels and we also think it will significantly increase the value of the mall. But even though the mall is almost 50 years old, it's still physically functional, even though it's heading towards economic obsolescence. So what we're asking for is to be able to use TIF, the flexibility to use TIF uh, to be able to support the mall's efforts if they're needed. 
Uh, we don't know yet, it's a little bit early in the process, but um, the TIF is our primary tool for helping this type of redevelopment. And uh, if we could get some help in uh, meeting the blight test through this bill, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you. I do see any other testifiers. Um, anyone from the audience want to speak for or against? Seeing none, member discussion. <laughs> Representative Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Um, Lind also, uh, being familiar with the Eden Prairie area, uh, a lot of infrastructure there. Um, the Eden Prairie community is one of the um, on a per capita basis, either adjusted net tax capacity or referendum market value, one of the most property wealthy uh, communities in the state. Are there, are, given the dynamics and the demographics of that region, is there, do we really need an incentive or a subsidy to redevelop that, a property that is located so close to the interstate, located to so many um, people with discretionary, high levels of discretionary income, is, is an incentive really incentive slash subsidy really necessary? Mr. Linda. Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, uh, Representative, it's too early in the process to know what the economic gaps in this deal will be, but we're, what we're hearing early on is that the demolition costs are gonna be significant. And so they're discussing with the city, you know, how do we close this gap uh, to move forward? And so we're just, you know, like we've done in many other cases over the last 20 years, we're just looking at the tools that we have, like tax increment, to see if it makes sense for the city to participate. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Representative Garofalo? That's it, thank you. Okay. Lee Kwam. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And as Representative Garofalo brought up, uh, location, location, location. Um, and with this being a huge metro area, um, yeah, I, I'm just surprised. I, I don't know if it, uh, if the management uh, made mis some mistakes, because with the, you know, the infrastructure and everything else, if I was going to, uh, you know, open a retail, or even a, you know, any kind of business that that wants traffic, and foot traffic and visibility. That's a prime location. Um, so it, it puzzles me a little bit that it's doing so poorly. Um, what is the impact of doing this TIF on other aspects of the community? Because you're shifting focus, resources, you know, to this one. Lo what is going to then suffer uh, you know, some sort of a uh, uh, lessening of emphasis. How is this, you know, what part of your, of Eden Prairie is gonna be hurt because you're diverting all the funds there? Mr. Lindell. Mr. Chair, Representative. Um, first of all, I, th I think the biggest impact on malls across the country is the increase in online shopping. I think that's hit a lot of malls and, and retail hard. Um, I think the mall's been managed pretty well. They've had pretty consistent management for many years, but at the end of the day, there's just less shoppers coming into the mall. I mean, fortunately, some of the department stores like Shields are knocking it out of the park. Target's doing well, but in terms, they're not, that foot traffic isn't going from Shields into the mall, unfortunately. So mm. that is the part of the mall that's really struggling. In terms of the impacts on a TIF deal, we don't know yet because we haven't really, you know, we don't know what their ask would be. We haven't really analyzed it. We just want to be proactive in preventing it from any further decline. So uh, that's, you know, we want to be open to the idea of being able to use TIF if it's needed. And we've been very conservative with our use of TIF over the years. So we'll, we'll look at that very closely and kind of vet the need very closely with our, with our uh, financial advisors. Representative Kwong. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so what I'm getting from your testimony is that uh, the, the shopping malls are a dinosaur that is moving towards extinction because of um, online shopping, uh, which makes me wonder why pour resources into something that um, is a dying entity. Um, either it's not a dying entity and you've got a great location, and you got to figure out what's going on to have success. Or it is a dying entity, 
and why be throwing good money after bad? Uh, you know, instead maybe look at a redevelopment with TIF that would be forward thinking and allow the community expansion and growth and vitality into the future. So I, I guess I'm a, a little bit um, re reluctant on, on this because of the conflicting of, uh, of reasons. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, seeing none, last word. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members, um, for this discussion today. Um, I do, I think, um, Representative Kwam, you you almost took the words right out of my mouth. We, you know, we're looking at this flexibility in TIF so that we can rejuvenate um, and, and redevelop the, the center and the area surrounding the center. Um, Eden Prairie doesn't have um, a traditional downtown space. The, the Eden Prairie Center is is the center of Eden Prairie, and um, and so because it is so close to um, a couple of the light rail stations, that um, once the Southwest Light Rail gets up and running, um, hopefully before my children graduate from high school, um, <laughs> then there'll be a lot of traffic coming in and out of that area. Um, we know that the business community has supported that s simply because of the economic impact that it will have. Um, We've built up some additional apartment buildings and complexes, and um, so I think that you know what Mr. Lindell was talking about is the um, you know some of the department stores that just are not seeing the the volume um, for the space that they they used to um, in and out of the mall um, because people are are shifting their dollars on, um, to online, and whether they're buying from JCPenney.com, they're still supporting the the store itself potentially, but they don't necessarily need the space that they have at Eden Prairie Center. And so what can we do to kind of um, redevelop and, and revitalize that area to um, enhance the future of the city? And I think one of the other concerns that I have is, you know, if not for some of the flexibility through TIF, residents will, would pay more um, through through city and county um, taxes in order to, to contribute to this redevelopment. So I think um, just the, a little bit of flexibility for the region as a whole. Um, we know that the Mall of America um, had diff difficult um, times during COVID, the Southdale Center has done a lot of different redevelopment, and we mentioned Burnsville er earlier. So I think that, you know, we, we see a lot of exciting opportunity um, in, in this property, um, and we're just um, looking for a little bit of flexibility. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you, and uh, your success is our success. So thank you for bringing this forward. Uh, Chair renews his motion that House File 5046 be laid over for possible inclusion in the Property Tax Division report. The bill is laid over. All right, that concludes today. Um, hope everybody enjoys uh, their break, and uh, we'll see you on the backside. Meeting is adjourned. <laughs>